going to do today is cover each of the cracking processes except ductile. I think you guys all figured out ductile by now with one example and it's all going to come back to what we've talked about uh, yesterday in terms of are we having deformation or not although most of the cases here we don't. Um, so it's a case where you don't have an overload fracture right here. So from yesterday, if you remember, I said you want to compare the, uh, the material capacity. So we have material. And then we have the, um, the stress or the demand. So I could call this the capacity, more or less. And I think that uh, what happens is you have a material capacity for flow. And that's, that's the von Mises criteria, so we can do whatever we want here. I'm going to call it the flow stress. And um, for the other one, I'm just going to put a star on it because it's so general. So kind of a critical stress. This is to deform and this is to grow a crack. And what we said here, as far as an overload fracture, we had this term with the square root of E we have the, the surface energy here, and I'm gonna add a term for you guys here, because if you have plasticity involved with growing the crack, there is some additional surface energy to create that plasticity. So it's not only to create gamma, I'm sorry. Let's do it a little bigger. So surface tension plus a certain surface energy for deforming. Because what happens, and I think you got all sorts of, you can, you can just put a constant to this, I'm not gonna bother with it. What happens if I have a crack, um, so say I have a notch in a sample, and this is kind of a typical sample, you can call it a Pacman sample we use for testing, and, um, or for compact tension and you have a crack here, if I magnify this area, in general, um, so this is good for now. If I magnify at the crack tip, I have a region that has plastic deformation. So this is where essentially the stress is greater than the flow stress. Most metal behave this way. If, unless you have cleavage in an overload fracture, you have this going on. So the tip of the crack is actually right here. It's very tiny. And then it's going to continue and continue. So there is more energy consumed in having that little area of deformation than there is in terms of opening the plane. So in general, this term here is actually more important than this one. If you are at very low temperature and it just happens to start snapping here, and that's the example of cleavage I showed, then that's why it fails at, it fails at very low energy because you don't have the high energy term for forming the deformation. Um, we don't want to get too much in the details of why this happens. I mean, you can take that, you know, you have a free surface here. So there's going to be a, a, and you have a lot of stress concentration or strength intensity, we call, around the crack. And that creates condition where locally, stresses are just really high. And what the material wants to do is release it. Um, now, this equation essentially for flow, still applies. So here we had the, the deviatoric stresses. So I had sigma 1. These are all differences. So it's, it's a what we call a deviatoric as opposed to a pressure. If you only have pressure in this equation, it all adds up to zero if all the components are the same. 
Um, and then I got 1 and 2. Square. And I have to throw 1 half of all of this to the 1 half. So things get very complicated with me here. OK. So it's just how it is. The material will take the easiest path, uh, meaning that what happens, again, if you raise this, which is what, the, what we, again, we have more variable, it means when we have the crack, we won't get that plasticity. And that will happen if you have a high rate. We, we, remember, we talked about the dislocation movement being thermally activated. So when you speed things up and you load that crack very rapidly, your flow stress is higher. So you can have that condition where you don't have the plasticity. Um, it's, it's just about as kind of, um, in terms of mechanism, if you understand all this, you're ahead of most of engineers. They have no, nobody really knows what they, they're looking at here and what's ductile, what's brittle. And, you know, in the end, you can, you can call a brittle fracture uh, whatever you want. It, you could call it something where you don't have a neck forming, that it's just, you could put back the two pieces and they still match. But if when you magnify and you see that you had this deformation here, it's, it's essentially dumbing yourself to think that it was really brittle. That it, um, so that there was plasticity essentially in forming the crack. So when we talked about the dimples, you remember I was showing you these stretch zones. These happen, if you have a crack growing in the material, they happen in this zone here where you have plasticity. So as you start deforming, you start forming voids. And these are not taken into consideration in that equation. It's more of a pressure effect in terms of um, it, it create, it increasing the size of void. You have free surfaces, so it makes sense that any void would tend to grow under a, a pressure when you have flow. So the idea here is that in this zone, it's not, um, you can't apply like the principle of superposition. It's not an elastic field, it's flowing. And that's when, when you have flow, that's where you can have a lot of opening of voids. If you're looking far away here, you can load and unload, it will look exactly the same. But in this area, when you try to unload, you get a compression of that zone. You stretch it and then you compress it. So if you have cyclic load, that's what's happening. That's why we see sometimes striations on, on a fracture surface. Um, when you see the beach marks on a fracture surface, if you remember yesterday, we had this big um, shaft and there was this line going across. I said, well, this, is, this was the last position more or less of where the, the crack was before the overload. So what happened here this front was deforming, instead of being perfectly sharp like I'm showing here, it was becoming a little blunted because of the extent of deformation that was taking place. So when you snap now, if the crack is like this, depending if you start cracking here or right in the middle, you're going to have a step. And that's where we can see visibly if the material is very ductile. Um, so it all sort of adds up to the same deal. It's, it's all about what's happening. Is it, is, are we going to reach a condition where the crack's going to grow? Or are we going to form like a, a neck in the tensile bar? Or a shear deformation if, you, if you're looking um, any, anything that happens around holes, normally if you have a hole that gets elongated, for example, in a bolted connection, that is an example where you don't have to worry about this type of behavior. You really just worry about whether it's deforming or not and if the, these conditions are met. There are conditions that I've seen even with bolted connection 
uh, when they were using wrought iron back in early in the 20th century where it will crack it, it, be, instead of starting to deform. So you have essentially this condition being met uh, as, a, as a delamination because the wrought iron, if I look at it in a cross section, had these sort of laminar defects in the plane of the bar that made it very easy and prone to just opening it up and, and causing cracking. So that is what we're going to talk about. Um, the cleavage fracture, one example I want to, let's go to the example. So um, this is a reconstruction um, the construction of a new bypass bridge for the Hoover Dam near uh, Las Vegas. Uh, it's all done by now. It, it happened about four or five years ago. So they were building up that arch and the distance between each shore was about half a mile. Um, so they had to get the precast modules here. They were about 30, 50 feet long pieces up there one by one. And the best way to do it was to have this uh, cable crane that you can see the tower, the two towers on this side, two towers on this side. Then they had uh, the platform going back and forth between them. They were able to incline the towers to be able to position exactly where they wanted to drop the load. This was a 50 ton crane. So it was by the project, it's, it was a specification for deciding how to design the whole thing. So each piece brought in had to be less than 50 tons. Um, we're going to talk more about the, the individual cranes here. So they're just essentially a single simple beam uh, held at the bottom and top and you have the, the guide cable, you have a backstay here. Um, so what happened is uh, one crane crumble, this one, um, sort of in the middle of it because you can see this is the lower portion um, and then you have the central portion and the head is going the other way. Um, so out of four of these towers making up that cable crane, one crumble and then the other is just starting to move very rapidly. Uh, this was a high wind situation. Nobody was hurt, uh, thankfully. Um, and when one of those beams on the back stay, and I, I didn't have time to pull the image, but it's, I may as well show it to you. It's, it's, all, it's as good. Um, the beam, well, I'll make it almost to scale. So the beam just looked about like this. little straighter but so sitting right next to it that's what it looked like and it snapped um, the cables if you look at the section it, the cables that were pulling on this section were were much smaller but um, the reason why the section snapped is if you if I look visu visually, I never got to take this to the microscope. There wasn't any reason for, for doing it. It didn't have anything to do with how the incident started. But I could see over here the little shiny region. It's a little bit like that IZOD sample that I was mentioning that there was typically in high loading, you have a little area that didn't stretch. And then obviously as you grow, it, it was stretching the other areas. So, the crack was going this way, and I could see that from all the crack propagation line. And I don't remember here if, if there was another initiation or not, but this area here was shiny. It, it, it really looked um, very unusual as far as a piece of metal. It's rare I see it, but that's an area where there was some cleavage, essentially. Um, because of the high rate, and that was one of my summary slides here, but um, you have a high rate, the material is highly constrained. If you want to try to, this is an area of high residual stresses also, if you try to deform in this little corner, 
it's very hard because you have a lot of material around it that keeps everything elastic. So there's, there's a higher tensile pressure as you load this up. And in terms of forming the material, it's in the formation processing we talked about, essentially this started as a, as a billet or a broom. And then when you got to the shape, right in the middle, you have some segregation, you have some impurities that are in higher concentration than close to the surface. Um, it was where the solidification terminated, you know, back, back in, in the mill. Um, so it's, it doesn't, I told you it doesn't happen very often nowadays, but that's an example from two or three years ago um, on a large structure. It used to happen in ships and bridges, and I, we could go through an encyclopedia of all the disasters maybe 70, 80 years ago. Uh, a lot of, of them happened in Quebec, actually. I don't know whether it was cold or not because we, we were not up to speed, you know. But uh, so we had to, one bridge came down two or three times. Uh, there were other issues. So that's what, always what the problem is when you have a, a collapse. If you don't have the knowledge to recognize some of the issues with the material, people blame it on the design and you change the design, make it bigger, well, if it's not ductile, it's still going to break um, in cold weather, and that's what happened. Um, so I think that's the story for embrittlement. You have to be, uh, you have to acknowledge it if you have, and, and some materials um, won't have a whole lot of um, high velocity ductility at ambient temperature. If you liquid, liquid at, uh, even magnesium at high rate is more sensitive than aluminum because it's not um, a face centered cubic structure. Uh, so there, some of the things you really don't have to worry about a wrought aluminum product, when you go to a cast aluminum, people do impact testing on it. Um, it's, some, it's part of some spec requirements. Uh, because you, 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 all of a sudden you have a different microstructure and you're more prone to um, reduce ductility, essentially. Um, so if we go back to what I was saying here, um, you have an effect of grain size if you're going to have a brittle fracture. And the best way to think of it is... Um, Crack starts from somewhere, typically from a surface or from an inclusion. One way you could possibly stop a short crack is at the first grain boundary. If the first grain boundary is close, you're still fairly small in terms of your initial crack. And it may stop there because then all of a sudden it needs to turn into 12 or 15 cracks to match the other crystal orientation. And that's what we were looking at yesterday um, on some of these images. So we were looking at here. When it switched from where the arrow is, it's all a clean cut. So it's going along one crystallographic plane. And then it turns into another grain from here to here, that's a small grain, and it only had maybe, yeah, five river lines or so. And then it, when it came to the next grain, it had a lot of river lines, maybe 15 here. So that's a way, in practice, if you have a smooth part, that's the way to, that you can arrest a small crack. Um, and that's why fine grains are good for fracture toughness, um, they're also good for strengthening, but that's not something that we really covered too much um, in this class. Um, any question on that brittle behavior? Um, it's atomistic. It's really a separation of planes. We don't have much contribution from that plastic term here, except at the river lines. Uh, between adjacent cracks. Um, embrittlement. I mentioned it yesterday and I showed you this image. 
Well, now it's going between the grains. Um, there are multiple ways that you can embrittle uh, steel, for example. We, we have more knowledge with steel because of all the applications. Um, the main idea is segregation. So it's essentially the contamination of the grain boundaries with elements that don't fit very well in the grains themselves, in the lattice, but because of the larger opening in the grain boundary, they, they can populate that area. And they just reduce the, um, the surface energy. Um, so it's easier to, to separate that, that bond. Um, you have phosphorus uh, that's very notorious for doing that. You, you have hydrogen that will do it, but hydrogen is, is very diffused rapidly. So one of the aspects of hydrogen is if you have stresses, it will move to that stress zone because there's a lot more, if there's tension, there's more opening in the lattice to fit the small atoms. Um, you can have uh, liquid metal embrittlement, um, which every once in a while in construction comes in <laughs> as a potential issue um, if you galvanize uh, stainless steel for, for certain reasons that you may want to do that in terms of compatibility with structural steel. The stainless steel um, uh, can be susceptible to um, the liquid zinc penetrating between the grains and causing a fracture in no load. Um, so it's all a question of whether in your application you have to worry about the integrity of the steel if it heats up to a point where the zinc will melt. Uh, so for fire protection in buildings, it could come as an issue. Uh, if it's a beam outside, you hope everybody's gone by the time that, that the temperature that, that you're starting to melt the zinc. But uh, it becomes a, a question of judgment. Uh, whether you really want to worry about it or not. But um, it's these sorts of things that are very specific. And uh, it's a little bit hard for me to go into all the cases. But um, there, one example I wanted to talk about here, and it's interesting because it took me a long time to understand the real reason. Um, when I was an undergrad, my TIS advisor brought me a sample. And we were a bunch of students. This was kind of part of a... Uh, term project, uh, looking at a jar of a tensile test machine. So these jars that you use to pull specimen and get, get the necking or get any kind of uh, mechanical testing that you want. Uh, that jar was probably 20 years old and it broke by hydrogen embrittlement. Uh, it was inside. Uh, well, no, I would say take it back. It failed by into a granular cracking, uh, which most of the time is hydrogen, but I'm, I'm, this is part of what I'm trying to go to. So you, you start with the hypothesis, okay, maybe there, there's some hydrogen. Well, it's being manufactured 20 years ago. It takes about a month for the hydrogen to get off at an ambient temperature if there was residual hydrogen, depending on your section. But anyway, hydrogen diffuses you know, at the ambient temperature in steel, so forget about that one. Um, it doesn't have any zinc on it that will create a corrosion that will generate new hydrogen. It was inside. So what's going on? Um, and the end story was it was an alloy steel. So it had some chromium and nickel. It was kind of an alloy you use for landing gears. Uh, the, the only few types of steel that you can use on an aircraft on landing gears, 43, 40 or 4330 uh, type of alloy. Um, and I bet that at some point there's a grad student that used it in an environmental chamber and heat it up. If you get that um, low alloy steel at a temperature, say around 300 degrees centigrade, and um, I, I was actually reviewing those numbers last night because it's not something that comes across all the time. So 300 to 350 with a low alloy steel, you get that segregation to take place. They, for, for a lot of thermodynamic reasons, and I'm sure you guys all love thermodynamic 
um, the, the, you, you have you're in a condition, it's, it's hot enough to have diffusion of not only hydrogen, but most of the impurities. And if the thermodynamic is such that you reduce the energy by going to the gain boundary, then yeah, it will do it. And now you cool it back down, and these heavy elements like phosphorus, uh, selenium, and there's, there's, a, there's a whole list. They'll stay there because uh, there may not be a big benefit anymore, but they don't have a whole lot of mobility anyway. So you don't, it's not something that you recover easily unless you take the part and heat it back up to put a, all the impurities into solution again and cool it faster this time. So this is a situation if you stay too long in a temperature range of 300, 350, uh, Celsius. With stainless steel, it's a higher temperature. Uh, when we talk about sensitization of stainless steel in the 600 degree temperature range, um, one of the things that can happen there is uh, you can form um, carbon, uh, chromium carbides in the grain boundaries. Um, and that just creates a depletion. It's really bad for the corrosion resistance. So. I guess the idea is um, we have our basic phenomena here, and when, it, when I said it, the, the material will always go for the lowest energy is when I talk about all these exceptions. It doesn't mean that if, it, you know, if you didn't have this way to break with less energy, it will break the way it will normally do it. Um, but in this situation, if you have the segregation, um, it's easier to go along the grain boundaries at that point. Yes? Um, just a quick question on that. So when you're saying these impurities um, kind of move to the grain boundaries, there are impurities that are already in the metal. It's not impurities that are diffusing in the atmosphere. Yeah, so as far as the impurity, just for the tape, the question was, um, is, are they coming from the exterior or are they already in the material? For this type of bulk behavior, normally it's already in the metal. Uh, when we talk about cracking and, and hydrogen-induced cracking, it will come from the environment. It will come from the surface into the crack. Uh, so the crack here can be a very good supply of impurities like hydrogen for, for a reaction. And um, liquid zinc will also go right through it through the crack. It won't really penetrate um, at a significant rate through the grains. It will really come in from, from the surface. All right. <clears throat> so that was exactly where we were going about stress corrosion cracking. Um, it's very common with aluminum alloys. If you look at a fuselage on an aircraft, um, if it's been an area where you have a lot of sea salt, uh, you're going to have more maintenance on it because you make it the same way regardless of whether it's going to be used in Arizona all the time or by the coast. But by the coast, uh, even though you put protection, eventually your coatings are going to fail near the rivets and you have some infiltration of chlorides and you can have what we call stress corrosion cracking. Uh, what happens there is we know aluminum forms this protective oxide. So if I go and magnify the crack one more time here, so we have the metal, and we'll make it blunted because that's what it is with aluminum. It's most of the time it's ductile. And you have this tiny layer that's the protective oxide. So what happens is there's a, typically a stop and go process with this oxide because it will form, and at the beginning, when it's really thin, it will sort of follow the material flowing around it until the point where eventually it cracks right here. And then all of a sudden, you, make, you advance with your crack, and you're going to start forming it again. It's a stop and go process at the crack tip. And it happens um, mostly in aluminum alloys and stainless steel because you're breaking that protective layer. Um, one thing that is interesting with stress corrosion cracking, sometimes 
you know, as the crack gets deeper, normally your crack growth rate goes faster. It's, you just have more, you know, that A term here, you have more energy. So if the crack gets, gets longer, you need less stress to, to grow the crack. Um, so you get in a condition where the rate is mostly controlled by all the chemistry that's going on at your crack tip as long as you have enough stress. So you still need to have uh, some plasticity to create that continuous breakage and the reformation of the protective oxide. Um, the example I have here is with stainless steel. Uh, it was a big rotor for a power plant um, kind of a big bar that was all around and they had a bunch of reinforcing uh, structure with welds. So it started uh, at a weld. Um, so we're looking at a cross section that was the fracture. And this is the initiation area. And again, you can see main crack propagation line pointing to this area here. And I could see even more precisely right around here. Um, and you see a few crack arrest line. There's one right here this one down there and then it failed there was really nothing left um, looking at it in the initiation area there were a lot of impurities here that I can only relate them to the original weld so it started in the well um, but it didn't stop you know sometimes you will have some issues in the well and then it will stop if the load is very low and the reason it didn't stop is there was enough chlorides to have that reaction going on. And the reason why this image looks so intricate is the way the, um, this cracking takes place, lots of times it involves shear deformation. So you're gonna come and, and essentially have a jagged pattern. It's not always gonna go straight and it will be preferential to a certain orientation in the crystal. So it typically goes through the grains, but with a special sequence. And um, so when you see this on a fracture, as you, you can probably tell, it's different from our dimples. It's different from our cleavage lines. Uh, it's not intergranular, so it's another form of slow cracking. And it could be related to the hydrogen, it could be related to stress corrosion cracking, but essentially it's a very slow process that takes place because of a combination of stresses. And in this case, the chemistry here, so you need a certain amount of chlorides to eat away your protective oxide and have this stepwise and gradual degradation. Um, it, it happens a lot. Um, and I think we were seeing that in the section on corrosion. I had a graph with percentages of failures and you know this this stress corrosion cracking is definitely in the top three or four any question on stress corrosion cracking fatigue um, we're in a situation where we can talk about it um, with certain basic knowledge so I've talked to you about the plasticity here um, that is a key in understanding now that regardless of the environment, I can be in vacuum and still have fatigue. The reason you have fatigue in these conditions is you really come and stretch the material, compress it, stretch it again, compress it, and it starts to flow and shear and advances into your material. Um, if you are in certain particular conditions, aluminum is one material where you can see it. You can see a line at very high magnification for each cycle where the cracks stop and go. But it's not in all materials. It's not for all ranges of yield strength. Um, so a lot of times the surface, even if you go at high magnification, is going to look smooth. If, I, if you remember the piston I showed you yesterday, uh, we looked around for, I think, two hours and found one area where we could see some individual striation at 20,000 X. Everywhere else, unless we knew that it was fatigue, somebody could mistake it for uh, a dimple fracture. 
because it looked rough with little holes and little peaks. And that's related to the microstructure of the tool steel. Uh, but the difference uh, with that profile is the, the edges were much more rounded than, than when you really have an overload tension. So it's, it's, there's a lot of learning that goes on between looking at it from the macroscopic scale, looking at it under the microscope, and then tying it to a mechanism of, of how, how things are actually breaking. Um, this section here um, originally would be just, oh, so you take the material, then after a certain period of time it breaks. And uh, that's what the SN curve tells you, and that's what I'm showing here. What I mostly want you to understand in a stress-strain curve, uh, no, SN curves, stress and number of cycle to failure, or sometimes you can have strain and number of cycle to failure. It's an overall response. It's an engineering way to look at it. It says, I don't really care if I have my part. And we do that with um, ATV components or car components. You take the whole component, you bang it up like crazy for 20,000, 20, 200,000 cycles. If it doesn't break, you say, this is enough. You know, it's not going to be more on the road. I'm done with it. I'm not even going to go and look what I've done to it. If it didn't break, it's fine. If it cracked or not, I don't care. You have the more critical approach where um, for aircraft engines um, on, in turbine blades, typically you don't want cracks at all. So you retire the blades before you even form a crack. So you need a lot more knowledge about you know, what is the what is the, the uh, incubation time for forming a crack as opposed to the time for a small crack to grow and actually break the sample. Um, <clears throat> so that's why I want to introduce that slide here where you initiate the crack. Typically, if you're at high stress, you're going to initiate